let's look at the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, when you look at the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide, remember that they're moving by diffusion, right? Diffusion is just where you have something moving from high to low concentration. Cells love diffusion because they don't have to expend energy to move something. <clears throat> Since these gases are lipid soluble, they'll cross cell membranes anytime they want. So when you look at oxygen, when you look at the swapping of these gases at the lungs, remember that's what's called external respiration. We saw that once before in a previous video. When you're at the lungs, obviously you want to get oxygen from the air that you breathed in, in the alveoli, into the blood. And it will do so because this blood that's coming into the lungs from the body is going to be low in oxygen. There'll be more of it in the air that you took in in the alveoli. So if there's more in the air, less in the blood. Into the blood is where the oxygen is going to go. Simple diffusion there. And then, of course, once you get to any tissue in the body, whatever that may be, now that you've got more oxygen in the blood, there'll be less of it in the tissues because the cells are consuming it. Well, more in the blood, less in the tissue means it's coming out of the blood. So again, oxygen's obviously coming into the blood at the lungs, out of the blood at the tissues. And carbon dioxide's always moving in the opposite direction. When you look at the swapping of gases at the tissues, remember that's what's called internal respiration. So when you look at this movement of, movement of carbon dioxide from the tissues into the tissue capillaries, well, that's because there's a lot of CO2 in the tissue because the cells are producing this material. There's going to be less of it in the blood. Into the blood it goes. Now you've got the CO2 into the blood. There'll be less of it in the air, in the alveoli, and out of the blood it will go. These two gases are always moving in the opposite direction. Now look at oxygen delivery at a tissue when a person is resting versus exercising. Let's say you're looking at something like skeletal muscle. So you're breathing in all this high oxygen blood in through these arteries to a tissue. When you look at where that oxygen's at, almost all of it's bound to the hemoglobin, 98.5%, just a little bit and dissolved in the plasma, 1.5%. So when a tissue is at rest, say you're just sitting, not really using these skeletal muscles in your lower limbs, whenever that blood comes through that tissue, somewhere around 23% of the oxygen is moving out of the blood and into the tissue. Remember, the oxygen is just moving from a high to low concentration from where there's more to less of it. But then let's say those skeletal muscles get very active. <clears throat> let's say somebody starts to run or something such as this. Well, now those tissues, those living cells are using up a lot more of that oxygen. There'll be far less oxygen in that tissue. That gives us a bigger diffusion gradient and a bigger difference in the concentrations of these gases as far as their partial pressures. And when you've got a bigger difference in concentration and a bigger difference in partial pressures, you get a faster movement. So notice how that jumps up from 23 to about 73%. It's a big change in gas movement, say in a tissue that's resting, versus when those cells are very active. Let's also look here at the Bohr effect. This talks about the effect of pH on the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. So what this talks about right here are pH changes and how it affects the movement of oxygen and how much will be seen bound to the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. Well, think about it for whatever reason. There's a decrease in pH, right? Remember, lower pH numbers are acids. Acids are where you got more hydrogen. So let's say for whatever reason, hydrogen is building up in a tissue. It's probably be going, going to be because of the buildup of carbon dioxide. But let's say you've got acidosis in a tissue for whatever reason. Anytime you get out of that normal pH range of 7.35 to 7.45, the proteins in the body start to change shape. And if you do that to hemoglobin, it'll change shape and let go of its oxygen and won't be able to easily bind to it. So let's say if a person gets acidosis or alkalosis, this is where they got too much hydrogen or too little hydrogen, either way, they get out of that normal pH range, that hemoglobin molecule will not have its correct working shape. And if that happens, it won't be able to bind to oxygen. Somebody's in big trouble right there. That's definitely one reason that acidosis can be deadly quickly. And again, if you look at this little reversible chemical reaction down here at the bottom, notice how CO2 is on one side and hydrogen's on the other. Anytime you've got a reversible chemical reaction, 
whatever happens to the material on one side will happen to the other. So when you get CO2 changes, you get hydrogen changes. That is why the respiratory system is the number one pH balancing system. Your body can quickly change how much CO2 is in your blood by changing how fast you're breathing. Well, when you change the CO2 levels, you change the hydrogen levels. But let's say maybe somebody's got a lung problem. Maybe they've lost alveoli for whatever reason. They've lost alveoli. They won't be able to get rid of the CO2 as quickly as they should. That CO2 builds up, hydrogen builds up. And acidosis is common for many reasons. That's one of them. That'll make it where your hemoglobin can't bind to oxygen. You get less oxygen being transported around and delivered to the body. Look at the effects of carbon dioxide. We just mentioned that. Again, since CO2 and hydrogen are on opposite sides of this reaction, whatever happens to CO2 happens to hydrogen. So if you get more CO2 in the body, you get more hydrogen, you get acidosis. And just the opposite would apply too. But you don't see alkalosis nearly as much. So when you talk about changing the levels of CO2 in your blood and body, you're going to change the pH. If you get it outside that normal range, you will not be transporting oxygen the way that you should. Temperature changes are also very important. When you look at all the variables important in homeostasis, pH and temperature are the two most important ones. Everybody knows most people keep a body temp around 98.6. That temperature changes too much either way, up or down. Again, the proteins in the body will change shape. You look at just one of them, hemoglobin, if it does that, it won't be able to bind to oxygen. You're not going to deliver it the way that you should. Let's also take just a brief look at fetal hemoglobin. Before you're born, you're producing this different type of hemoglobin. We'll just call fetal at this point right here. Reason being, you're not moving air in and out of your lungs before you're born. So you don't need a hemoglobin that's good at taking oxygen from the air. You need a hemoglobin that's good at taking oxygen from an adult hemoglobin. And that's exactly where you're getting it from. You'll see in another video that before you're born, there's a barrier called the placenta. It keeps the mother's blood on one side and the baby's blood on the other. Well, obviously some things can cross and oxygen's one of them. So before we're born, we need a type of hemoglobin that's good at taking oxygen from mother's hemoglobin. And that's exactly what it does. Now, it can do this easier than adult hemoglobin for several reasons. One thing, fetal hemoglobin <clears throat> has a greater concentration of hemoglobin in it. So that's going to help it to have an attraction for that oxygen. The oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve is shifted more to the left. And that means that this fetal hemoglobin has a stronger attraction for oxygen. You put more of it in the red. You make a molecule has a stronger attraction that's going to draw oxygen towards it. And that's exactly what you need, especially because your, so, your cells are so active growing at this time. There's this other material called BPG that causes the reds in the hemoglobin to release oxygen. Well, that doesn't really affect fetal hemoglobin. So if it's not affecting them, they won't be releasing their oxygen. That's going to cause them to bind to the oxygen better. And also, you get this movement of CO2 across this placental barrier, which also helps. Think about when the mother and baby's blood comes together. There's going to be more CO2 in the baby's blood and less in mom's. So the CO2 is going to move towards the mother's blood. When you get more CO2 in her blood, you get more hydrogen. And that change in pH will change the shape of that hemoglobin, causing it to release oxygen and shifting it over to the baby's side. That's what's called the double bore effect. Now, when you look at how carbon dioxide is moved around your blood and body, it's very different than the oxygen. Remember, the hemoglobin carried 98.5% of the oxygen, but it only carries 23% of the carbon dioxide. The plasma gets about 7% of this CO2, but most all that CO2 is moved around in the form of bicarbonate on. Again, carbon dioxide quickly combines with water. That'll make carbonic acid, and that breaks down into hydrogen and bicarbonate on. So here's the CO2 here, here it is here, and here it is off to the right of that equation. So in that form of bicarbonate on, that's how most CO2 is moved around your body. Whenever hemoglobin has released its oxygen, it more easily binds to carbon dioxide. 
And that's just something called, something called the Haldane effect right there. Let's look at also something called the chloride shift. Now remember when you get to the tissues in the lungs, you want to move this carbon dioxide and oxygen. The cells have actually figured out a clever way to actually assist this, something called the chloride shift. And what the cells are doing at that time are swapping chloride on with bicarbonate on. So you'll definitely see this happening at the tissues and the lungs. Well, think about this. As the chloride on comes into the cell, right? You're swapping chloride for this bicarbonate on. As chloride comes in, the bicarb goes out. If you lower the quantity of the material over here on the right side of this reaction, that's going to lower the quantity of the material over here on the other side. So what the cell is doing by pumping this bicarb out, that lowers the level of CO2 inside the cell. And that's good because at the tissue, you want that CO2 coming into the cell. And if there's less of it into the cell, it's going to move from where there's more in the tissue and less in the cell. Just simple diffusion from high to low. Now, when you get to the lungs, you're going to see just the opposite happen. Now you're going to see bicarbonate on coming in and that chloride coming back out. Well, if this time you're moving the bicarb in, that's going to raise the level of this material, which will raise the level of this. That's going to raise the level of CO2 inside the cell. And since there will be less of it in the air in the alveoli, it's going to move out of the red blood cell in the blood and move out into that air in the lungs. And of course, that's exactly what you want to do with carbon dioxide. You want to get that CO2 out of those tissues and of course into that air. By swapping the chloride for the bicarbonate, you're just manipulating the HCO3 levels, which manipulates the CO2. And by changing the CO2 levels, you can definitely affect its movement. So there's other pictures and again, the links to the study guide.